I was out of control. I just was doing whatever came. And my kid at that point was a few years old, and I mean, I was barely taking care of her. Star Parker's reckless search for happiness would bring her to a breaking point and would dramatically change her. Star Parker entered her teen years in an America reeling from the racial turmoil and sexual upheaval of the late 60s. Her love for excitement and risk easily led to a lifestyle of reckless decisions. I love life and I like freedom. I would go to school all day and then sneak out at night and we would go break and enter people's homes and we would go get in a lot of fights. Finally, it escalated to one of my really close associates at that time uh, wanted to rob a store. He's like, run, run, and the store owner, you know, started yelling and screaming. That's when I first thought, wow, there's something wrong with what we're doing, and we could actually end up dead. And so that's when I started running, and it was my first experience with feeling that I am really going down a path of no return. So I'd hang out at Venice Beach, I'd hang out in clubs and take a lot of drugs, and I kept getting pregnant, and then I would just have abortion, and then I'd get pregnant again. It was just like, this is, you know, crazy living. I didn't like the decisions I was making, but I didn't have any control over them, I felt. I just was doing whatever came. After four abortions, Starr decided to keep her next child. As a pregnant mom on welfare, she began to look for extra income. I went into an advertising agency looking for money under the table. This particular agency was being run by three men, uh, good-looking men, I might add, and I thought, oh, I can work here. This would be great <laughs> because I was a party girl. Um, and that's when they confronted me. They said they didn't pay under the table. They were legitimate businessmen. <laughs> I'll never forget. I was very confronted to them. They were confronted back to me. And they finally told me my lifestyle was unacceptable. I couldn't work there. And I was really upset at this point. And so I asked them, unacceptable to who? And they said it was unacceptable to God. And I just stopped. I, did, I didn't know what to say. Up until that point, I never really thought about God. And I never really thought about God thinking about me. When Starr ended up alone in the hospital with an emergency C-section, she received an unexpected visitor. Ken, who I'd met at the advertising agency, who had called me a couple of times during my pregnancy to let me know that you know they were thinking about me, he came to the hospital. And I don't even know how he knew that I was at the hospital. And he's telling me that, you know, God loved me and and I told him that, um, you know, I, I don't know why I couldn't love myself. And he left, and I left, I went home, and I didn't change anything. I just kept partying and kept, kept on welfare, and he kept calling. And then finally, I just went to church with him. I thought maybe what he was saying was true. Maybe God did love me. It seemed peaceful. It seemed um, controlled. I was out of control. And I never thought I wanted control. But when I saw that, I wanted it. I knew I'd sin, but I think when it became crystal clear that I needed Christ, I had to be forgiven of something really deep was when abortion was mentioned because now we're talking the taking of a life. And that's when I realized that I really did need to be saved because not just saved from, you know, hell. I needed to be saved from myself. Star surrendered her life to Jesus Christ and the difference in her quickly became evident. Every time we would go to the Bible study or go to the church, he would bring forth a message from the scripture. There was something in there that would convict me somewhere else that maybe I thought or didn't think about at all. Before I was out of control sexually because I had no reason to say no. Now I have reason to say no because the scripture says say no. I was still living on welfare and that was just how I lived. 
And one day the preacher said, what are you doing living on welfare? And I thought, what? How does he know I live on welfare? <laughs> he said, the government is not your source. Turn in your Bible. And he had his turn. Sure enough, it said, and my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So I wrote my caseworker and told her to take my name off. God delivered me. He just really, really has recovered my life that I'm confident in that if he could, would do it for me, he could do it for somebody else. You know, it's not just something that somebody told me and I'm kind of making it up as I go along. I can be confident in something that is eternal. His hand is a loving hand and I just owe my life to him. Mm -hmm.